Well, yesterday, Lou Gehrig Appreciation Day at Yankee Stadium. July 4th, 1939, Lou Gehrig gave the famous speech. And yesterday at Yankee Stadium, our own Sarah Langs was honored at Yankee Stadium with, I'm sure, Lou Gehrig there with you. Uh, seeing the pictures with the skipper and Garrett Cole, your mother and father, uh, just what an unbelievable day it must have been for you and your family at Yankee Stadium. It was absolutely incredible. I mean, it was so powerful to be there on that day. As you said, on the 84th anniversary of that speech, he got a tour of the Yankee Museum. I They put one of Lou Gehrig's old hats on my head. The museum curator did that. I was able to hold one of his old bats and to have that tangible connection was really, really incredible. And the Yankees did such a great job. I mean, this was part of their annual Hope Week, which is now, I believe it's gone on every year since 2009. And they choose members of the community to highlight different groups today. They're in Hinchcliffe Stadium in New Jersey. But the amount of thoughtfulness and energy and everything that goes into the day the way that Jason Zillow and the wrestling Yankees put it together is just absolutely outstanding. And my parents, I mean, they both were great pitches. I was so, so happy for that. Yeah, yeah, when you think about the New York Yankees and how really big they are in American sports, I mean, we've talked about it for many years, as big as the NFL has gotten still, the Yankees are still the one team you know, you can look at the NBA. A lot of people look at Lakers and Celtics, now the Golden State Warriors. I mean, football will be the Dallas Cowboys. But really in American sports, the New York Yankees, because they've dominated the eastern seaboard for so long where most people live, they are such a big deal. And they just really show you the power that they have for good. And when you talk about the fight for ALS that you're a part of now, um, just talk about, you know, what the Yankees have been able to do for awareness and raising money. I mean, it was wonderful because it wasn't just me. And I made that clear to them when they reached out and said they wanted to honor me as part of Hope Week. I said, okay, but I'm not the only young woman living with ALS right now. This is a group that people don't think of. People think of Lou Gehrig or even men who are older than that. And they think of ALS. And they think a very important part with advocacy and awareness is for people to realize that this can strike absolutely anybody at any time. So there's a wonderful group I'm a part of called Her ALS Story, founded by a young woman named Leah Saban Hagen. And there are a handful of members in the tri state area. The Yankees were gracious enough. To honor and host not just me, but I believe seven or eight other young women, all of whom were diagnosed under the age of 35. They were there. We were all out on the field. The Yankees took the field, gave us all blue and white roses. It was such a beautiful moment and really, really important to show from baseball, from Lou Gehrig's sport, and from his team the acknowledgement and understanding that isn't just about people who look like a Luger. Every patient is equally important and deserves for this to be cured, but just to show physical, tangible evidence of other people, other people like me who are dealing with this, I thought was so important. And of course, I mean, everything they did, they all signed a baseball is the best shirt that is going to be auctioned off signed by every member of the Yankees, and that money will go to Project ALS, one of the many research organizations that's helping to try to find a cure. They also made a $10,000 incredibly uh, generous donation to Project ALS. So everything they did top to bottom was really, really well done. Again, not just from the monetary standpoint, which is very important to get money 
towards research, but also just the personal side, the thoughtfulness and the understanding of how do we show who people are with ALS and what they're living with right now. I think it's a great point because I, I, I would even say for myself, you always think of people who are older have ALS. You don't think of people who are younger. And that is such a great point and something that uh, yesterday was able to highlight that this is just not people who, let's say, are over 60. Exactly. Well, Even Lou Gehrig was not your typical case. Your typical demographic, as you said, is 56 years old yeah. and a white male. But that is not everyone who is dealing with this disease. There's so many others. So to be able to highlight that, and I think everyone at that game, it was a sold out crowd. We had a little rain delay to start, you know, a little summertime thunderstorm. <laughs> but after that, there's 40,000 plus in the sand, seeing all of us on the field, hearing us recite Lugerg's speech, and just realizing how prevalent this really is, as I've been saying so much since I shared this publicly in October. This is not a rare disease, it is an underfunded one. So there's just something so wonderful about baseball as a whole on the go day. And now the Yankees in this really, really special day, being able to help show the world what ALS looks like and why we need to cure it. For our audience to donate and help, there, there's there's quite a few that I've researched. Where would you like us to donate? Well, I love that you mentioned that because the truth is there's so many great organizations out there right now doing so many different things. There are great research organizations, one that I partner with a handful. It's called Project ALS, another out of Boston called ALS TDI. And of course, Mass General Brigham, the hospital is doing incredible work as well. But there are other great organizations such as IMALS, which is purely focused on current patients and helping their quality of life. And of course, our great friend, Boog Shambi, works with Project Main Street, which is also solely focused on current patients and helping their quality of life. So I'd say to anyone who is interested, figure out what part of the disease means the most to you and means the most, whether it's helping those who are currently battling or helping the next generation. Anything that you can do is very, very much appreciated. And I would say that I always want people to make sure they're donating somewhere that really speaks to them. So do a Google search, read about a couple of different places and decide what means the most to you. And of course, you are still working tirelessly on the sport that you love, Major League Baseball. We're heading into the All-Star Game. What 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 excites you? I mean, we're talking about because this is this is our last show, right? Well, I won't be here. So uh, this is my last show before the All-Star break. Uh, what excites you going to see, uh, you know, the all-star game Pacific Northwest up in Seattle, uh, the best players in the world get together. What is, what excites you about the all-star game this year? I mean, what doesn't excite me? I love all-star week. I love the home run derby. I love the game. I love all of it. I'm really excited to see us have two rookies starting this year. Josh Young of the Rangers and Corbin Carroll of the Don Max is the first time each team, AL and NL, will have a rookie starting in the same year. But for me, the creme de la creme of the entire week is the Derby. I love it. It is the best of any exhibition kind of moment. And we have almost a full field now. I saw Luis Robert uh, announced earlier that he's going to be doing it. Really excited to see who the final name might be. But, I mean, we have Vlad Jr. who went 91 home runs as a rookie back in Cleveland in 2019. We have Julio defending runner-up in his home ballpark. There's just so much to be excited for. And, you know, I loved when we found out the full reserves and pitchers on Sunday. We saw all of these videos from teams about guys who are making it, them being told. And I'm thinking about Brent Rooker. I mean, 
that video um his reaction and the photos of him with his head in his hands i mean to everybody who says that oh you know having every team have an ulcer keeps guys out the rosters always work out for themselves their replacements everything happens and to anyone who thinks then we shouldn't be sending a guy from every team. I direct them to A's Twitter. I direct them to the Tigers. I direct them to any of those teams and the way those guys react. And I mean, it means so much to these players to be able to go. They bring their family and the home run derby again, have all those kids running around on the sidelines, my favorite part. And it's just such an amazing moment to celebrate baseball. So I'm so excited for everyone who made it, and I'm so excited to see how it all plays out. I remember years ago, we first started seeing the gala, you know, after they, you know, have home run derby, after they do all that kind of stuff, they, you know, have kind of a party. ESPN used to, Back when ESPN had baseball tonight, they would show a little bit of it. I love now how MLB Network actually makes a show out of it, a red carpet situation, and it kind of highlights. It's like baseball's finally catching on because they've been doing this for years in the NFL and having award shows and everything. It's like this is actually very, very smart. Can't wait to see it. And, you know, I just a uh, little bit worried about some of the guys who've gotten hurt. I mean, now Mike Trout with the ham eight bone, mm -hmm. that's never good. Shohei Otani leaving the mound yesterday in San Diego with the with the nail and the blister and everything. It was hard to believe how many guys were falling like flies yesterday down in San Diego for the Angels. I know of the course of a handful of uh, hours, right? It was yeah. Trout going on the IL, Rendon, and then Otani leaving that game, which is just such a bummer to see. I mean, this is, I believe, third straight year now. Where Trout has been voted in as the starter, but not able to play because of injury. He's amazing. I mean, none of that is anything against him. And you guys know, I mean, whenever you see a guy get hit on the hand, my heart just drops. And it happened with Tyro Schroeder for the Giants uh, in New York, I believe, on Sunday Baseball. He was hit by a pitch. And I immediately said outside to myself, oh my gosh, he just broke his hand. Yeah, And lo and behold, the same thing had happened. So you hope that he gets back soon for Trav, but I hope I haven't seen whether he's still going to attend the events, but I hope he does because everyone wants to see his adorable little son, uh, Bat, right, B-A-T, or his initials, which was purposeful. And I love seeing how the families enjoy everything. So I hope we get to see him on that uh, truck or car, whatever it is, for the red carpet show, as you mentioned. But certainly for the Angels, it's a tough spot. All right, your Mets. I'm looking at it right now. 39 and 46, even though they've won three in a row, 18 games back. I mean, the Braves are so, so good. That is, the Mets had a tough June. There's no way around that. I believe they had 13 games in June, but they held the lead and ended up losing the game, most of the majors in the month of June. But so much of that is about how good the Braves are, and I think they really deserve to hear that. I mean, this is a team that leads the majors and runs scored in any inning, and their run scored is in the first inning. Their first inning performance across the board, run scored, hits, home runs, run differential, you name it, is leading the majors. And it's because of Ron Acuna Jr., who's already with 20 plus homers, 40 plus stolen bases, and it's July 5th, and they haven't played yet today. So having him starting those innings for them, starting every game has been so powerful for an offense that has really, truly been relentless. It really does put the Mets, the Phillies, and the Marlins who have stuck around in a really tough spot. But, I mean, all props to the Braves for being such a dominant team yet again. All right, so uh, I guess – if we're running the team and you got, I mean, you can have the owner come out and have the press conference and you can have Seaver the dog and you can do all that kind of stuff. But 
there's some tough decisions to be made. And, and to be honest with you, Sarah, there's some tough decisions to be made with a lot of teams, right? I mean, I can look at the Boston Red Sox at 43 and 43. I can look at the San Diego Padres at 40 and 46. Teams that have talent that the percentages tell you you're not going to be in the postseason unless something miraculous happens. So if they were to call you their GMs and say, what do I do? Would it be smart to unload some guys, to bring in prospects, to, to, to get lower salary going to maybe get under the thresholds? Like, 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 what do you do if you're the Mets and you're the Red Sox and you're the Padres, you're some of these teams? Would you recommend for them to maybe wave the white flag, trade, and lower some salaries? Well, this is one of those moments where I'm yet again glad that I don't have to make those decisions <laughs> and I instead get to react to them. But I do think we're going to see an interesting kind of confluence of two things over the next uh, almost month, three weeks or so here, because the new postseason forum, which we saw last year, definitely makes seem to believe rightfully so or not, that there is a little bit more hope left. Where you are sitting on July 5th is maybe a little bit brighter of a possibility than it was in prior postseason formats. But then you have the fact that even still, does that mean you're primed for a long run? Does that really mean that you're going to get him? And I think the teams you mentioned are kind of all in different spots, despite being in very similar records. I mean, the Red Sox are in a division that is going to finish as the best division in baseball history, a bad any division to have at least five teams in it. They're absolutely, as a whole, crushing the competition, the overall win percentage, the win percentage of the division, which, of course, you board games up now is really, really high. The Red Sox, unfortunately, probably cannot make up all of that ground with all of those teams ahead of them. The Yankees, even without Aaron Judge, are up there. You have the Blue Jays, you have the Orioles, and, of course, the Tampa Bay Rays. So, to me, the Red Sox are in the spot where it would make sense to make some of those trades Anyone who has a year or two left of control uh, on short contracts, measuring the on short contracts. To me, the Padres are the team that I still think can get it together. I know that they haven't quite been there yet, but there's so much talent on that team. The way Blake now looked in June, the fact that Juan Soto is having another great year. Xander Bogarts is so good. Tatis has been really, really good. To me, that Padres team could still potentially do it. So I'm not sure I would be ready to tell them to make that trade, but I do think from the mess, they have a handful of veterans who would make sense to see what you can get for them. Well, thank you so much for coming on the program. It was so great that you had such a special day yesterday. Thank with everybody you. that was involved, especially your parents, the, the pictures and the videos were absolutely beautiful. Enjoy the all-star game. Enjoy all the festivities. We love you, and we'll talk to you after the break. Thank you so much. Have a great all-star break, and great to see you.